guys. Oh. We did shoot in Kazakhstan where you really, you couldn't mess about with your vehicles. And all the crew and the safety people would take a Discovery, but they wouldn't take a Range Rover. And we'd have an afternoon whizzing round and round the farm, see who could go fastest, demolish most of Hertfordshire. I got down on my knees and grabbed hold of Stanley horses I got. And they were both wetting themselves with like, what are you doing? That was a joke. I was like, sorry. Hello and welcome to episode 49 of the Collecting Addicts podcast. That's my dog barking. And he's excited because Chris Cooper tells us that within a couple of days, this is the one year anniversary of us first recording together, which is an amazing uh, accomplishment for all of us, given that everyone's so busy apart from me, everyone else has real jobs. So today we'll start with something of medium temperature, but still pertinent to driving in the UK, maybe America as well. Why is but why will the Discovery 4 always rule? Why, whenever I see a Discovery 4, do I go, that's the best thing they've done in the last 20 years? Yep. Now, this was proposed by Neil Clifford, who I often go to first, but this time I'm going to go to Chris Cooper, who I believe, like me, is a great fan of this car. I am. Uh, it's peak Land Rover. It's peak Land Rover. If the Ineos bombardier, bomb loader, gun carriage, grenadier thing is a reverse... TARDIS. This is the an actual idea. TARDIS. This is an actual TARDIS. It is bigger on the inside than you think it's going to be. Um, and it's better than the Discovery 3. Discovery 3, some of the signing bits of Discovery 3, I think are a bit neater, a bit simpler. Um, but it had that 2.7 V6 diesel engine, which wasn't really quite up to the job. Although, if you can find a unicorn V8 Discovery 3, Manual. Normally aspirated V8. That's the thing. That's mm -hmm. the thing. But Disco mm -hmm. 4 with the 3 litre, the SD6, so 258 horsepower. If it was a dog, it'd be a Labrador. Other dogs are available. Other lovely dogs are available. Um, Neil, you've got a very, very lovely Ridgeback. But occasionally, you might want a Ridgeback to bite something. But a Discovery never would. A discovery would never bite anybody. It would just want to help. It would just reach <laughs> out its doors and reach out to everybody and say, I can do that. I can help. Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be no it's problem. Labrador. Hmm. Whatever hmm. you want to do, I can do. It is the Labrador. It's and there was a period, somebody I've talked to the boys about this, and they said it's not the problem is for the, the TOF trucks, trucks for TOFs, Range Rovers, is that it's gone a bit, Discovery 5 was completely, I mean, what's that number plate thing that, Jerry, it's you again, that silly number plate thing. You can visualise <laughs> Discovery 5 as a car. It's a rare thing, but actually, you don't need to speak. So viewers will now see what Discovery 5 is. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's what it is. It's no, no, yeah, no, no friend of ours. No. No friend. So I think it's peak Land Rover. It is, it's just the best thing. It will always, we've got one. Uh, we bought it in, Ooh. yeah. Oh, God, look at it. Yeah. Look at that's, a, that, that, that's a Fulham scene, if ever you see one. What's the collective yeah. noun? What's the collective noun for more than one Discovery 5? <laughs> Tell a us, gag. Christopher. I think Make it's it a gag. Mm -hmm. it gag out, of no. discos. Is it a, is um, it a wank? A <laughs> wank. Yeah, a wank. <laughs> I'm trying to be a bit more polite. A but, wank of discoveries. And you could get, a very, very briefly, you could get a Discovery 5 in green, but then Jerry decided that was far too rural and acceptable. In the, some point in the early 2010s, <sighs> anybody who's anybody had a Discovery 4. Didn't have a rangey, had a Discovery 4. We've got one we bought in 2016. Are you saying that you were, are you saying that you're one of the people that was somebody? Once. When I was fast, I was once somebody. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, actually, you actually asked us to sell it to you, Monkey, when you were here when we were going to uh, Spa. Lovely you know, car. It was a so lovely car. My father-in-law, uh, Lynn's father, John, had it for a few years. I mean, very sadly, passed away you know, a bit ago, and we got it back. And we'll never sell it. We'll sort of make sure it still goes. So no, I think it's peak Land Rover. 
it was the real TARDIS. Discovery 5, no. The Defender, the Defender 90. I know love it. Edward, I know you love it, but that is a inverse TARDIS. If what, the, mo the modern one? Yeah. The, I, like, the, I like it, really. I, I like it as well, but it just... Discovery 4 is unpretentious and it works and it's the right shape. You get more in it. Peak Land Rover. Yeah, I agree. So let's speak to Edward Lovett, who probably doesn't really give a shit about this subject. No, I've never been in one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've never, I've, I've never, I've wanted, I've never wanted to be in one. I've never needed to own one. I'm all right, thanks. What okay. do you say to that? Over to you, Manish. <laughs> Manish. <laughs> Manish, do you feel as passionately about the Discovery for? Maybe not quite as dispassionately. I, a friend of mine who has two boys and a beautiful red lab has had one, I mean, for absolutely years, and it used to occasionally give um, my son and me a lift to, uh, to football. And on the rare occasion that my wife would also join us, you had his wife, so you had four adults, Three kids, yeah. so seven of us sitting as if we were in a lovely sort of car. I mean, they are yeah. unbelievably big cars. And with two dogs, yeah. we had two Cohen Bella as well. We, we were absolutely fine. And there were little tiny details. This friend of mine is in the motor racing business. He used to uh, commentate, and now he does something else. But um, he chooses his cars very carefully. His father was actually a Works Lotus driver. And... Um, and uh, competed and uh, won his class at Le Mans back in the 60s. So he's, you know, his daddy was very quick and this guy's he's quite well known. And he chose this car because he really wanted something that he could drive around in London with and do a school drop off. But they've got this fantastic place up in the lakes and they do a bit of, bit of off-roading there. And um, this car's amazing. Yeah. This car's amazing, it does both, but um, I will end with the RAC reviews, rather pithy assessment of the car, they described it as Solihull's clever and classless masterpiece. Well, that's yeah. good. Who wrote that? The RAC? Yes, it's in the RAC review. And I thought it was beautiful because that, that car doesn't good. scream, oh my God, at you when you see that in London. No. The fact that it really can work off-road. Those guys have sat down and gone, no, no, no. This is a Land Rover, just, you know, so yeah. a modern version of it, but it, that's an amazing achievement. No, G wagon. Yeah, it's 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 more attractive. You're right. Um, it, it's remarkable that 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 vehicle. I think I think we we now realise that we sometimes vehicles become instantly iconic, and that that was from the moment it was released. It was just a brilliant piece yeah. of styling. It was a great piece of proportioning. You just it just looked right. A bit like yes. a racing car. Sometimes you see a racing car, I think that looks right. It's going to be fast. Discovery was always the same. I think rarely for a car, I slightly disagree with Chris Cooper in that I think the facelift, that, as in the Disco 4, is better looking than the Disco 3. Some of the Please. plastics on the Disco 3 look a bit ham-fisted and have aged really badly, whereas a Disco 4, to me, still looks like it could have been built yesterday. Well, Disco, that's 3, true. Disco 3 looks quite old. And the interior on the Disco 3, if you look at it now, is a bit Fisher-Price, whereas the Disco 4's We've got one at grip and it well, Neil drives it the whole time. Yeah. It's a fantastic vehicle. And I maybe here's the question, and I'll pose it to Neil Clippen as I hand over now. Do we <laughs> look so fondly upon the Disco 4 because it's pre because its successor was so shite? If if the five had been magnificent, would we have forgotten about the four because we wouldn't need to celebrate it? Because it wouldn't because it wouldn't remind us how hit and miss Land Rover can be. What do you think, Neil? No, I think the five is all the, the five is almost invisible, isn't it? It's so crap that everyone's totally ignored it. Yeah. Um, I always call this to be slightly controversial. I always call it the Discovery Three because the four is the facelift. Really, the big jump forward was the three, wasn't it? Yeah, two to three. Two thousand three or two thousand four. In fact, Emma and I bought one in two thousand and five six. It was almost our first sort of grown up, let's go to a dealership and buy a car because, oh shit, we've got children and a Lancia Integrale is not a sensible <laughs> enough four door car, which um, I bought for that 
reason of going to pick up Ruby in 2000 from the hospital, traded in. Did a, you still live in central in a, London at the time, Neil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lived in Muswell Hill and I went to Howard Wise and traded in an M3 Sport Evolution E30 for 12 grand and put can yeah exactly exactly we've all got these little stories this is definitely one for a subject once isn't it an extra 1500 quid and i got a candy red dealer collection integrally four door because i needed a four door car to put a kid seat in the back yeah. but then we obviously realized that's not very sensible we went and bought a discovery 3 and i think that was such a leap forward it was really the the the, the the jump into the modern era. And it, I think the three is much prettier than the four. And mm. actually, when you study it, the interesting thing, and we, we know we may be a little bit over, over tough on our friend Jerry. Jerry didn't design the three, he but he, fu he fucked up the four. Yeah. I thought, see, I think the four looks better. No. Well, it doesn't. It's not. I, 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 I sort of nailed it. Three I is thought... like a Tonka toy. I think it's completely clean, both interior, in terms of its symmetry it's pureness it's off-road capability just standing there you can see this thing could go across mountains i think it got a bit fussy with the four the grill's a bit fussy yeah here's, so here's, here's here's a poser for you this is a this is one of the few car companies that was willing to shamelessly hang on to its iconic vehicle the defender or whatever you call it back in the day for you know, decades and decades and decades. I think that that, that okay. If we say the three and the four are the basic, same basic shape. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think it, I think it was iconic enough, and, and it was such such a sales success that I wonder why they didn't run with that and say, well, let's have, let's have a vehicle that looks vaguely like this for the next thirty years. Well, they should have. That was a mis that was a mistake. Yeah. That was, I, I, and in fact, the new Defender really is the evolution of that. It is, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. The Defender Five. Oh, Chris, how does that fit into your theory of? Car manufacturers always know what we want, and they always get it right, even if we don't know that they do. No, no, I don't. I don't. I don't say that. I just think they. I think they know more than we give them credit for. Of course, they make mistakes, but I. But I. I think the worst thing they could do is to is to clinic customers to to in order to make cars. If you make yeah. what a customer tells you they want at that time. Well, you take you take that information too seriously. You know, you don't know what sort of day they've had. Also, when you go into a clinic, you you think you you go into the mindset of thinking, I'm trying to be clever, I want to make a statement. If you walked in and said, just make the one you made before, but a bit better, they wouldn't believe you. But that's what most of the time yeah. is what you want to say. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. So, I think the 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 bit even now, because at the weekend I had to do something, I had to move a go kart at the weekend, but like a racing go kart. Boys have used, and I occasionally had to go in. And if you put the third row down, which you have down most of the time, the boot floor is completely flat. You put the middle row down, the boot floor is completely flat. It's clever. Can't do that in a Defender, the current Defender. No. The, yeah, fact, I, I like the interior as well on the on the on that three yeah. floor thing. I think it's yeah, chunky. It's, it's just yeah, it's yeah. yeah. The only Land Rover I've ever been in a professional situation where it was afforded the same respect as a Land Cruiser. Like we, did, mm. we did a couple of shoots in Africa, and we did shoot in Kazakhstan, where you really you couldn't mess about with your vehicles. Yeah. And all the crew and the safety people would take a Discovery, but they wouldn't take a Range Rover. Yeah. So it, you know, it, it's yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's right. iconic, and I think you know if you if if Land Rover is wondering what they should do with the next Discovery, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We're, here. Is, We're here for what, you. Is that the defenders? Neil says, "Is that now?" Well, the I defender? think defenders doing that job now, but I'm sure they. I'm sure they. Can, yeah, I'm sure there's a gap between. There's a gap between defender and Range Rover, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I'm not sure there is, because because a heavily spec, fancy long wheelbase defenders quite a, quite a bit of kit now, isn't it? It's a lot of money, but it still isn't quite as roomy inside. That's the problem. Well, they're trying to. I suppose. Yeah, I suppose the strategy was let's have a McCann stroke. KN thing that's a yeah. bit, but that isn't really what Discovery Five did. No, it got caught between the worst of both worlds. Yeah, it it is. Yeah. It's peak Land Rover. It's the Labrador. Every home should have one. Well, <laughs> yeah. Edward, even yours. Yeah, I'll have the Labrador. I'd buy one now if I, if I could. If I could, you know, we're all we're we're all searching every week on on. Yeah. Um, notable, noticeable websites, which I can't name, but um, for a manual V8 
Yes, yeah, if you have a low mileage them. manual V8, do they get don't, one. Unfortunately, no, they just don't exist. It's not there isn't one. There was briefly in the Disco Four. There was a five litre normally aspirated. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they did do that, did they? Yeah, they did a five litre one in the facelift car, but I think they were mainly left hand drive. Yeah, yeah. and um, they all went. But the you know those who know have got their. I think it was a four litre, four point two normally aspirated. Four point four. Four point four. That's it. Was that a BMW engine or not? Was the five litre the BMW? No, it, was, uh, it wasn't a BMW engine. TVR. Um, it was. What what year are we talking yeah. about? Two thousand and four, five, six. That was a Jaguar engine. Yeah, I think. It was, was it, uh, it wasn't the 4.4. Four, okay, so, so someone will come and correct us. It, it was a 4.4. 4. It wasn't the BMW 4.4, 4. 4, was it? It wasn't that, no. That well, was the four, a, no, it was all no, no, well, The 4.4 4 no, was no, the BMW. It sounded like the two old surgeons in Harry, uh, Harry Enfield. Now, don't remember. Was it the 4.4? 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, what a fabulous <laughs> bottle of burgundy this is. 4.4.5. Right, okay. Ah, Gyro. That's somebody else. So my... This was proposed on a message from a... A good friend of mine who's currently on holiday in the Maldives, where I think he's just he's just uh, getting very wet and blown around the place. So uh, to T, I'm sorry that you're having a windy time, but your suggestion of who would your five motoring heroes be to invite to a dinner party, um, both dead or alive, I thought was rather good. And it could take up a bit of time, but we've got a bit of time, so let's go on with it now. Um, let's start with Edward Lovett. First of all, would you cook for them or would you take them to the canteen? <laughs> that's a very good question it would have to be the canteen Christopher yep. as, you've given, yep. as you've given me the choice then it'll be the <laughs> canteen so most of them are alive one of them's not hmm. James Hunt okay Kimi Raikkonen it's a dinner you know, party not a piss up you know that you, you know where I'm going with this yeah. <laughs> not to the canteen I've put John McGuinness. God. Chris Harris. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so far, I've got, and I'm obviously at the table as well. So there's, there's six of us. Um, yeah. So we all, we all turn up a bit early. That's only um, four. So, that's only yeah, five. Four. No, that's four so far. I've got, okay, I've sorry, got sorry. the sixth is coming. So we all, we all turn up early. And because we met at the pub down the road first, get a few in before we go for dinner. Is that called priests sit, these days? Sit, we sit, we sit at the table. Chris is, Chris is already behaving appallingly, and I'm having to apologise to the staff at the canteen, saying, look, I'll, I'll try and keep them in check. And we're waiting for the final guest as a bit of a surprise. And, of course, this person would always turn up fashionably late. And... He arranged to have the uh, the trees cleared outside the canteens so he could land in a helicopter. And out of the helicopter, he gets in the most beautifully tailored suit. And Luca de Montezemolo walks oh, in nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. and sits at the table with these five half-cut <laughs> reprobates. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and can puts, us, put, puts us all in puts us all in check. <laughs> me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine him trying to understand John McGuinness? That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I, I, think, I think he would be enlightened by the experience. Let's go for Chris Cooper's. So uh I talked about this with the boys, and their suggestion, which is not my suggestion, because I got I had a slightly different take on this was uh, Stefan Beloff, yeah. Duncan Hamilton, Tony Rolt, and Donald and Malcolm Campbell. I know it's too many, but hey, this is a fantasy. Oh, the and Campbells, Campbells, and Roger Penske okay. to, to pay for the whole thing, get in order. But my take on it was, I sort of said this last night in our little chat, British rally legends have all died too young. Roger Clark, Tony Pond, Colin McRae, Richard Burns, all taken from us yeah. too young. Tony Pond, probably for the younger viewers, you have to go and look him up. He was this incredibly, there's a bit of him in all of them. They were all quite laid back in their way. They were all utter, utter gods. And the whole point of a dinner party is 
you want to do it with some people you have fun with uh, who aren't there to prove anything to anybody else. You just want to have fun with. So what I do, I'd invite them all around to the farm. There's one more guest to come. I'd invite them all around to the farm. And at the bottom of the farm, actually, you guys are all going to come and see us in some way. The bottom of the farm is a little valley, runs the length of the farm. And at one end of it is a beautiful little dingle dell type. We call it dingle dell. Beautiful sort of little opening with some trees. And you could put a big, like, wartime old mess tent in it. And we'd have a barbecue. And the other person I'd invite would be David Richards. That's a bit self-serving. He's a mate and a colleague of mine. But the reason why we'd invite David, because I think he's worked with all of them. I'm not sure about Roger Clark, but the rest of me clearly wow. have. Richard that's cool. Colin. That's cool. And I think he was a co-driver for Tony Pond in the late 70s. Um, so apart from wanting David, because David could pay for the whole thing. Sorry, David. Because uh, he's, a, he's a fantastic host. He runs two hotels out in Cornwall. I'm a big fan of them. So forgive me for my self-interest. And, and he would bring some toys for us to play with. He'd bring the pro drive hunters that are currently, fingers crossed, in the hands of Sebastian Lowe, possibly about to win the Dakar rally as we're recording this this week in Saudi. So you'd have Roger, Tony, Richard Burns, Colin, David and me trying to keep order. And we'd have an afternoon whizzing round and round the farm, see who could oh. go fastest, demolish most of Hertfordshire uh, in these two wonderful pro-drive hunter off-road monsters. And then in the evening, we'd do a barbecue. Uh, I can't cook, but I can do a barbecue. And we'd have a barbecue and a few beers down the bottom of the valley. Nobody could hear us. Nobody could see us. That would be a dinner party from heaven. That's what I do. That's very good. Nice. Clearly, you're disqualified because you actually came up, between you and the boys, you came up with about 15 guests. Yeah, so, yeah, you know. But, hey, this is a fantasy. Um, Neil Clifford. Oh, this was, a, this was a tough one. This is one of the toughest yeah, no. ones I've had to think about, actually. And I concluded, and I'm four dead, one alive. I don't know whether that's... Um, so am I, actually. Same yeah. mix as me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm yeah. four dead, one no, alive. No, 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 I'm three dead, two alive, sorry. Okay. Um, and I... I I did the people and then after it, I worked out why they asked thus. And uh, as I've mentioned many times before, too many times, I'm dyslexic. I don't really read stuff. I look at pictures. But there are there are five journalists who I do enjoy reading. And therefore, they may they obviously do something to my brain to make me concentrate and make me read that others don't. And they are Alan Clark. Obviously, he wasn't just a journalist. He was an all right general legend um, as a, me a member of parliament. But I I I've, I've read his book a hundred times. Um, Dennis Jenkinson, who, you know, was just a, a total legend very early on. And, and I caught him later, but loved the chat. LJK set right. Be it that I read, I read a lot. I don't understand any of it, or certainly about five percent of what he wrote. It sounds but good. It's more about the character. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so sad that I was never even just able to meet him for two minutes. Um, Russell Bolgin, because for me, he was the guy of the nineties. Um, he was the guy of the nineties, and I, it sounds a little bit sort of subservient or, or. or blowing smoke up his ass, Chris Harris. But I'd not, it, it's not just about the way Chris writes. And Chris writes better than he says he does. And and everyone, you know, everyone I speak to has enjoyed your book, Chris. It's more about having you there as a character because you would orchestrate the whole thing beautifully. And we'd be in the, we'd, we'd be in the guinea grill in Mayfair in the private dining room and have massive steaks and beautiful, a really decadent red wine, roast potatoes, cauliflower cheese, sticky toffee. You know, it will be like a billion calories and four million bottles of red wine. And I, I, I couldn't do that without having Chris there because he would be able to. As long as I'm there as, long as, I'm there as conductor, I like that. I'll take. Yeah, that. you you can conduct the whole thing, and it would just it, you know I'd I'd pay a lot of money for that. Sort of what I do here, really, just keep. It's yeah, 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 yeah. No, but also you would laugh a lot, and it would just be brilliant fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, and wouldn't you wouldn't miss us at all, would you? Sure. I mean, the rest of us. 
Yeah. Well, of course I wouldn't. Yeah. You weren't invited. That's so that... a lovely group. I like this one. This is I'm, I'm, uh, Manish. <clears throat> I was thinking about um, different aspects of, of cars and conversation and, and time. And I was thinking about somebody who could be technical, somebody who could be witty, somebody who was a little bit like me from the outside who'd contributed um, in no small way, even though she um, probably had no idea at the time what she was doing. So my main guess would be, or my first guess would be Professor Sid Watkins. I mean, I loved him. I actually loved him. I got to know him for two or three years. And uh, in fact, the last day I met him was uh, four days before he died. Wow, and um, and you know he he was he was a very special man, and I loved him because he was so irreverent, and he was a little repository of secrets. Oh my mm. days! Yeah. Did no. you know him? Nice. Did you tell me to? Did you know him sort of medically, professionally, or motor? No, no. If, I, if I'd met him, if I had met him as a medical student or a junior doctor, I'd be a neurosurgeon. There is no way I'd have had anything to do with. It. I mean, I he was just so far beyond a legend. And we, we just, it's, you know, you meet someone and you just click. And he, he used to introduce me because I met him obviously through Senna. And he used to introduce me in Formula One as a failed neurosurgeon. He said, that's why he does orthopedics. There was no way a neurosurgeon would train someone as hand. In fact, he, a uh, little segue, he introduced me to Sterling Moss. And do you remember when Sterling Moss stepped into his lift, but the lift wasn't there and he yes. fell his that's ankle? It's dreadful. So I remember this, it was Silverstone 2010, and somebody wheeled Sir Sterling in a wheelchair, he had a blanket on, and he said, come on, lad, I want to meet, meet you to, I, I want to introduce you to um, Sterling. So he said, Sterling, this is Manish, Manish, this is Sterling. So I went to shake Sir Sterling's hand. He said, don't shake his hand, examine his ankles. So <laughs> what I did it was like a reflexive medical team. I got down on my knees and grabbed hold of Sterling Moss's ankle. And they were both wetting themselves with like, what are you doing? That was a joke. I was like, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so, and he knows, he knows, he knows everything about everyone, everything. And he, he can be fantastically indiscreet. He loved Glenn Morangi. So uh, the Professor Steve Watkins, my second guest, definitely has been dead for a while, but it would be Dorothy Paget. I would love to meet the person who financed the Bentley blower. And she right. financed it for Birkin. She sat down and thought we needed to win Le Mans, and that was the way to do it. And she put her own money into it. And I love people like that. Somebody, she could, she, she, she was an okay driver. This isn't something that she could ever have experienced personally. But she financed that blower program and, uh, you know, through thick and thin. And I, I think she would have been fascinating. She lived in, what was the castle she lived in? Um, it was oh, in that. Kent, was that? In where? It was in Kent. She had Hever, Hever Castle? I can't remember. But she lived in this magnificent castle. I mean, she was just, she was cool. She made that happen. And, and I think that's massive. Um, the guy I think he would keep us all laughing if Prof didn't would be Clive James. It just yeah. could write anything very, very clever, brilliant, um, brilliant Italian speaker. I didn't get to know him very well, but, um, and he was of course the ultimate F1 guru. His sort of comments on those early F1 tapes were just so, so pithy and brilliant. And in fact, if you read one of his books, what he tells you about, do you remember the Las Vegas Grand Prix of, I think it was either, well, it could only have been one of two. So it was either 81 or 82. Um, he said that um, Princess Stephanie was there and she was going out with Alain Prost and they were filming. It was 81. It was 81. It was Clive James in Las Vegas. And he said, you know, at that time, they just couldn't film her. And all the footage they had, they had to kind of destroy. And it was just a hell of a, hell of a circus. Um, the next guy can't speak English and the fifth person would have to do some translating. But it would be wonderful just to have him because of his aesthetic sense. And that's Marcello Gandini. He's still alive. Mm. And I could just listen to him. I, I've seen so many YouTube interviews with him as to how he goes about the process of design, how he literally imbues every curve, every art, just sees things in a way that we don't. And I, I'd, I'd just love to have him. And of course, 
Edward Lovett has to have the fifth and it has to be Luca. And this, you know where this dinner I thought you were going to invite Edward. I thought you were inviting me. I was oh, as the I translator. Would. <laughs> I would if we did Chris's How rules. How dash does he feel? <laughs> no, it'd have to be Luca. And I'll oh, tell you what, Eddie, Eddie, you would do this dinner. He has this amazing, um, he has a lovely terrace behind his, his villa in Bologna, but even better than that, they've got a pizza oven in this kind of area. It's got a roof on it. And uh, to have fresh pizza, a bottle of Montezemolo red or two or 10 with these characters on lovely. a summer evening, candlelit in President Montezemolo's garden would be my dream dinner. Beautiful. All of these I want to be present at. So the, the, yeah. I've, I've overlapped a bit, but not as much as I thought. The only name that I'm going to repeat is not what is not. There were two mentioned. I, I want someone that's gone really fast and, and just just speed for the sake of speed. So I want Malcolm Campbell there because uh, it's a discipline that I've never. I'm too scared to take part in it. I just I, these people that were so driven just yeah. to go fast and knew what the risks were. Yeah, it's a good I one. Just, I just love them. So so I'm going to go for Malcolm. Um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, Ari Vatanen is just, he's my hero. Yeah. I just think he's amazing. Yeah. And, and I think he's a natural raconteur. So this is a difficult one. I'm not just going to, I don't think you just go for your heroes. You've got to imagine what they'd be like around that table. Haven't no, absolutely. You? Totally. So, so I think Ari, I don't know, I, I've read a bit about Malcolm Campbell. I think he's, I think he'd be up to the task. Um, Ari Vatanen, yes. The third one is, it's a bit weird, but I, wa I wanted someone from the motor racing era where they risked it all, but who isn't the obvious character, but who I think wrote the best motorsport book of all, and that's the unfair advantage. I want Mark Donahue there, because I think that book demonstrates that in the right company, he, he could speak about the sport and about how human beings interact with speed and racing way that no one else can. And at the very least, I want to ask him, how did you write that book? It's so good. Um, the next one, I'm amazed no one's mentioned it so far, but I think he might be the most influential person in the motor industry in our times loving cars, and that's Ferdinand Pierre. Why wouldn't you want Pierre there? Mm. So he'd, he'd probably tell us all what to do. He'd tell us how we could sit, what cutler we could use, and he'd feel underneath the table to make sure there are no sharp edges for our shins to bump into. And he'd disconnect the air conditioning, I'm told, as well, because he hated it. But Pierre just has to be there because he's the boss. Yeah. You could sit yeah. there and say, so you did... The Audi Quattro, the 917, the Veyron, just about every Fast 911. It's not a bad CV, is it? No. Um, and the only person I want from the modern era there is someone who, until recently, I wasn't even a fan of. In fact, I'd say he was one of my least favourite F1 drivers for a long time because I couldn't quite understand the way he did things. But now I think he might be an absolute legend, and that's Sebastian Vettel. I think Vettel would be the best dinner guest because he's clearly interested in the subject. He's clearly very funny has a great sense of humor very. and i think he'd have some great stories to tell exactly. so strangely if, if someone said to me which f1 driver it would be i wouldn't even think about it it would be sebastian Vettel. yeah i think that's a really good call that's my group mm. yeah i think it's a really good call i think he it's funny how sebastian's gone the low point of that wheel banging yeah um road racing thing. and baku where he literally wanted you know he almost did a dan tictum on yeah. Lewis hamilton and he went from that to where he is now, where he's clearly, he's always been funny. And the mates of mine have worked at Rebel said he's just really, re very bright and very funny. The Campbell thing is interesting, isn't it? I, do, I can't remember, you just go down wormholes since I started you. And I remember on Sunday evening, I ended up looking at a load of stuff about Donald Campbell. So in 1967, he died on, is it Coniston Water? Lake Coniston, Coniston yeah. Yeah. Um, on the second run of two runs to set a new world water speed record. It's estimated that on the second run where the thing took off and he was killed, he was doing 330, 340, someone will correct us in the comments. That would still be faster now than the current world water speed record. That's how fecking dangerous <laughs> and sketchy that is. Yeah, it's Campbell's. Just unbelievable. Campbell's, what? were they like there's just something <laughs> about guys who will do crazy speed on water yeah. you remember you know what killed peroni wasn't a ferrari it was a speed yeah. it yeah. almost killed cows talky cows power by the way in a, in a few weeks time we'll, we revisit this and we'll ask the fellow addicts 
the people that didn't crack their lists because I've got 20. Oh. Mm. And now, mm. my, my, my Malcolm Campbell was so nearly Craig Breedlove because if you read his first book, yeah, I mean, what amazing character, absolutely yeah. Google him after Craig yeah. Breedlove. And Art, 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 Art Arfons, the other guy, oh, theory, me. those two who were just trading in the late 60s, mid late 60s, just trading the land speed record. Oh. Have, okay. have a look. If you Google Donald Campbell's E type, he had a matching E type to his boat, he did. and it's DC seven registration number parked Ooh. on the yeah. lake next to the boat. I his mean, boat number. Cool. His boat number was K seven. Just oh. mega cool. Yeah. Right. We're moving on. Uh, so we go from something definitive and lovely to something that could end up being quite weird. <laughs> How to be a passenger in a car. Oh. Are you a good passenger in a car? Are you a bad passenger in a car? I can't even look at Chris Cooper in this because I've I've, I've ridden shotgun so many times and our attitudes towards that role differ quite severely on what one is allowed to do and not, what is authorised and what is not. So first of all, I'm going to go to someone who probably didn't even think about this, Edward Lovett. What's your strategy when you're a passenger in a car? Well, first of all, on the track, I think I've covered this, but the last time... I'll be a passenger on a racetrack was at Yas Marina um, almost two years ago with you, Monkey. Oh, okay. And that says a lot because I trust you being a passenger in a car, but I don't need to put myself at risk being a passenger in the racetrack on a car. And uh, it confirmed to me that day that uh, I won't be doing it again. So that... <laughs> It's quite exhilarating. Right, nothing went wrong. No, 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 no. I know, I, I know you didn't, you but I what you say in? that again. What what motor vehicle were you in? We were in a the most incredible nine nine one point two GT three RS. That the price of the car, the price of the special options on the car, were twice the value of the original list price of the car. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> were you on the whole circuit? Did you do the whole circuit? Yeah, we did the whole. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. And we, I, you know, I went out. I, the circuit's amazing. And and, and mm. to be honest with you, Chris, Chris was not really pushing it, but it's a very quick circuit. I just, yeah, you know, that's a problem, with it, Chris. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to get all morbid here, but clearly there's been some pretty awful stories in the past. Someone that Chris knew particularly well from Monaco that. Uh, didn't survive being a passenger in a car on a racetrack. And I just thought, this is just not a place I need to put myself in. So, can I just but, clarify? The, the extras on this 991.2 GT3 RS were twice the base price of the car. Yeah, so let's if the base price was 150 the extras were 300 Was this blue whale penis skin on the little slab? Oh, you, you can easily go don't, crazy at CX. This particular, you 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 don't normally see tinted coloured carbon on a nine eleven. Every bit of carbon on this car was tinted in colour, inside and out. Okay. Uh, pl plus leather to sample. It was just you know his collection's just amazing. And afterwards, Edward offered him about one hundred and sixty grand for the yeah, whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you <laughs> lost those work. options, mate. I'll give you one hundred and fifty grand. I'll Good give you work. this for it. <laughs> um. Anyway, on, on the road. I've got to say, I'm real. I'm rarely a passenger, and that's a really important statement in this. That's true. Though. I don't think many of us are very yeah. often. No, I, Carry on. I, 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 I'm, I'm rarely a passenger, and but when and when I give my friends the opportunity to drive my cars when I'm in them, I want, I want them to experience what I experience: the, the performance, the cornering, the braking. So I, I encourage them to drive the car in a spirited manner. What I don't need them to do is test the grip levels in a corner. That's the only thing I manage with them uh, is just making sure they're not trying to see what the front end or back end grip is like on a car. Um, and that's all I've really got to say on the subject. I, I don't like being a passenger. Yeah. Chris Cooper. So I think the art of being a good passenger is finding a way of combining uh, coaching skills, uh, navigation 
expertise, uh, <laughs> general general operational expertise and knowledge and how to set up the car. Uh, I think also acting as a spotter, so telling the driver what they might have missed, <laughs> be it other road users or traffic signals or directions. <laughs> Um, offering a running commentary. Oh yes, they're doing well and not well. Oh yes. So, um, but most importantly, most importantly, imbuing a sense of understanding in the driver as to the body language that they, as a driver, should convey in the car that they're driving. So I do this with Lynn quite a lot actually, and she absolutely hates it, and I don't <laughs> understand why. <Yeah. laughs> I don't yeah. understand. Uh... Why. So I can just like... imagine you leaving home with being in the passenger and by, 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 before you even got past Dingle Dell at the bottom of the gully or valley or whatever it is, she jumps out and swaps over. <laughs> you can fucking drive. That is, that is, <laughs> that is exactly what Bruce, I just, I just I think... realised, I mean, you have missed your vocation. You should just basically, you you should be a driving examiner. Can you imagine? No, I, would, I wouldn't get out of the <laughs> test centre. So at the bottom of our... No, he should be a driving here. instructor, instructor. Yeah. So at the bottom of the lane here, there's a single track lane. At the bottom of the lane here, there's now some traffic lights, which is the bane of the modern world. Why can't you just have give way signs and people work out? Anyway, some traffic lights here. But there's a little gap just before where the T-junction hits the main road. And if you're waiting there, you can just get into the... So you're effectively in front of the queue. And I think that's an okay thing to do because it then conveys to somebody you're going to make progress. Otherwise, you're sort of sat there when lights go green. Is, is it me? Is it you? You, me? So I find myself saying to Lynn, actually, you can get into that space. Look, the lights are about to go. You get in there. Go on, go on, go on, get in there. Get in there. Yeah. She finds this really frustrating, and I don't know why. And I say, but it's good. And she says to me, do you think, how do you think I cope when you're not in the car with me? And I <laughs> said, you know what? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. So the only person actually I haven't actually no, I do do it with everybody. I tend to take over. I mean, Mike said before, I will take over the controls. Um, because I'm a bit um dyspraxic, I can't do left and right. Everything's left, whether it's right or left. So I have to point. So on our many journeys going across Europe, I would sit in the front of the car because monkey would prefer to. And I have to say that's fair, because he's um Whatever people might sort of like to imagine about Monkey, um, he's a bloody impressive road driver and obviously super fucking fast on the circuit. But as a road driver, that last bit going to the Nürburgring, because if you've got something a bit tasty, I think I'm actually going to enjoy this. I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to see. And it's just super smooth and it flows. And it's lovely and so forth. But on the motorway to there, all bets are off. No, Monkey, it's that way. It's that way. And I will literally put my hand in front of his face. Hmm. So that's the bit, so let, just to let you I'll interrupt here because I'm, I'm aware of a lot of this the first thing you need to know about Chris Cooper is to enjoy his company in a car you need to really love him very much otherwise <laughs> it won't make sense to you and it might come across as being a little bit um, domineering but what he because he's got this dyspraxia thing with direction these were called the fingers of truth and justice in the car so wherever they went you followed those otherwise you got told off but the if he's sitting in the passenger seat of a right hand drive car if he wanted me to go right on the motorway, he would cover my eyes with his <laughs> arm. And it would take a while for him to realise that I couldn't see where I was going. And quite often, yeah. we were going well over 120 miles an hour. So this arm would shoot out and go, it's that way. And, and the running commentary was always wonderful. So first of all, he'd get in the car from the start, and get in the car, and he'd just all controls to suit him. So if I had it set and the temperature was good for me, it would all be changed. Well, you had it That's wrong. Now, this had never, ever happened to me before, but because he was paying for my racing and was being lovely, I wasn't going to argue, and it's taught me a lesson. I don't care now. People get in the car, I don't care what they do. As long as they don't change something terribly, it's fine. So Chris would take over, and what he would do is he'd give a running commentary, and the running commentary started out by being really, really busy. He would, he would literally tell me what I was doing, but as he got to know me better and the years went on, and he got quite tired of even his own humour, he yeah. decided... To, to, to make it more sparse. And, it, and then anything that's sparse hits harder, much harder. So what would happen is, I it, we could there could be 20 minutes when we wouldn't talk about my driving, or, or he wouldn't acknowledge anything. We'd be mid-chat, and he'd say, you could have done that better. <laughs> yeah. or, or he'd say, 
that didn't go very well. <laughs> or, and these these re- these utterly, you know, they're just crucifying phrases which just come out of nowhere. And I go, oh my God, I've got that wrong. But I, do you know what? If you've got someone who's driving you respect, this is becoming a bit of a mutual fellatio session, but he's, he's obviously a very talented driver. If you've got someone that you respect in the passenger seat, you take their criticism. And I think one of the things we'll get to in a minute is if, you, if you're the mismatch is if the person that's sitting in the passenger seat is either too good or too bad a driver compared to the other one, you've got fireworks because one of you has to bite your lip and the other one probably what's going on. But with, with Chris, I, I'm the first person I've ever allowed and the last person I've ever allowed to sit there and tell me whether I'm a bad driver or not. And he wasn't, he wasn't shy. He wasn't. <laughs> and the most important thing is you've got to like the same stuff on the radio. Yeah. Or the player. And you and I are both complete addicts for cabin pressure. Yeah. We listened to it again. We had that trip back from the ring from yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul Ricard. Yeah. In the Porsche press car, the nine nine, the Gen One nine nine one RS XLG. And we did it XL the XLG car, and we did it in one hit because we thought we'd learnt Ricard in the morning of a tractor. We thought bollocks, let's just drive home now. So we spent the second half of the day just driving home. On the day of the very first time you appeared on Top Gear TV, driving a yellow TDF, which you'd driven at Paul Ricard the previous autumn, I and we listened to cabin pressure and everything else, and we just. It was one of my favourite ever drives as a passenger. We actually split it a bit, but it was just lovely because we both liked the same stuff. Hmm. And I did a bit and, of coaching. And actually, I think let's let's just see what Neil Clifford says. But passenger, I don't. I I'd, I'd like to think I'd draw. I'd reach the same conclusion as Edward that I'm not a good passenger. But actually, there have been times when I've really enjoyed being a passenger. So Neil Clifford, what do you think? I I don't. I cannot name a time that I've enjoyed being a passenger. And it's funny because I, I was sort of contemplating this. Why is this? Why, you know, because <clears throat> it's because if I think if you enjoy driving, you're sort of annoyed that someone else is driving and you're not and you're a passenger and you're yeah. not. In, the thing that you love almost most of all is your it's been taken away from you. Someone else is doing it. And if and I, I, I'm the I'm the um, what did someone call me the other day? Um, I'm the connector. I'm the organizer of often our sort of mates' trips, the Le Mans or driving to the Pyrenees or whatever. And I coordinate it all and I make it all happen and book the house or whatever. And I say to my um actually my PA does a lot of it. It sounds terribly wanky, doesn't it? And she says, Well, how many of you going? I said, Well, there's there's eleven. Well, how many, how many bookings on the Eurostar do you want? Well, obviously eleven. You know, there's eleven blokes <laughs> and eleven. There's eleven blokes and eleven cars. The worst thing would be if you had to go with another bloke in yeah. a car, in your little trip that you've you know takes you yeah. like three months to organise it. You do it every year if you're really lucky. I think post COVID, it's all gone tits up. All of that stuff, isn't it? Some we all like to be a bit more alone now than we used to. I think it's terribly sad. We need to do more stuff together with blokes not being passengers driving silly places so the only time i'm really a passenger is with with my blessed wife and what i tend to do is be very annoying for her because i'm worried about the wheel hitting the curb or you know is she has she seen the car on the right when she's yeah. over so I, I tend to sort of keep my mouth shut be a bit annoying and feed her wine gums is about the only constructive thing i can do is unwrap sweet <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and because we're we're not clever enough to buy these Edward Lovett style water bottles, so we get the big two liter revenue, and you've got to keep taking the lid off for her, and you know, giving her water, and then giving her another Murray Mint or something. It's about the only <laughs> constructive thing I do as a passenger. Really, passengering. <clears throat> you don't do that much driving. So, how much passengering do you do? I can, you know, get passengered a bit. And um, I, I think music, something, you know, whoever, whoever said that, I think that's so important. If you, and the driver has the veto. I mean, that's the, the big deal about Do it. They? I don't think the driver can't. And so if you're a passenger, mm. for example, with my sister, who's 14 months younger, but is about 13, it's a very, very painful experience listening to basically the equivalent of K-pop. Or its English equivalent. That's that's very annoying. Secondly, for a while, she and her husband had a 
very nice 911 convertible, but I'm never, I've never been convinced she ever learned how to change gear. And that was particularly painful in that car. So it's such a beautiful car. I mean, she's the only person I know who lets go of the throttle before she changes up rather than going the other way and flipping. And the other thing I do is I always find her braking points absolutely terrifying. So my big thing is you, you're sitting there, you're trying to shut the fuck up, you're being driven somewhere, so you can have a drink, she maybe won't. And what you're doing is you're constantly braking, and then she starts to spot it. She can see your right leg twitching. And turns like, is there something wrong with my driving? No? You just sit there, no, nothing at all. What are you doing? What, what do you do? And then the other thing that she does is she, she knows where she lives very, very well. And she will often go the wrong way up a one way road. Wow. And, then, and then goes, everyone does it. Like yeah. that. You, 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 so, yeah. I, I, it's, not, it's, not, it's not something I absolutely love. And I mean, I've been a, a passenger with Mr. Harris. I don't know if you remember vaguely telling me off but remember when we were in Italy and we were driving and I was convinced we were in the wrong lane it sort of said lane through. oh and yeah yeah I, I was just hanging in different lanes yeah no 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 it was great you you turned around very coolly and you said I've done this for a bit boss <laughs> <laughs> it's not my first barbecue yeah <laughs> I think uh, uh, passenger is in interesting for me there's a sweet spot for it for me I, and I realise that most of the time I want to be if I'm not driving, I want the person driving to 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 have one of a few roles. I've either got to be someone that I'm so interested in being in the company of that I don't care if they're a good driver or not. You know, if, if you if it if it's someone if it's a sporting hero of mine or or someone that I just wanted to meet, I wouldn't give a shit if they couldn't drive as well. I just be it would be a chance to have uninterrupted contact with them, and that's a privilege. So I'd be okay with that. I I more off I didn't need it to be either a great driver. Or it needs to be someone that's in control of a vehicle that I wouldn't be allowed to be in unless they were driving it. And outside of that, I don't, unless it's one of my children, I don't, or I'm getting pissed, I don't really want to be in the passenger seat. I have to say, I'm not very good at it. Yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give you a good, I don't, and I don't passenger very often. At the, at the moment, the only time I really passenger is when I'm giving my son a little go in the car because he's not, he's not, he's about to do his test uh, quite soon. So yesterday I went for a little drive in uh in the gulf that we have and we were just out in bristol going around l plates on just going around and around and i as we we're going down a particular residential part of bristol i said to my eldest i said um that's a plain clothes car i know those there's a few of those around and quite often they're the armed response units as well around here so i said it's nice to see that they're out and about looking anyhow about three minutes later i spot the fact this thing's done a yui and is now following us and i thought there's an outside chance he spotted me but that's weird and he wants to have a chat i don't really see that we're in a golf it's not a fancy car so i start making sure we're going round and round in quite large circles on streets and this thing follows us down every weird little turning and i think well, i've had enough of this what's going on so we pull over on a main road in bristol and it pulls up behind us so i jump out confidently and i go towards the police officer who's already walking towards me quite confidently and so i say is there a problem he said yes this vehicle number plate comes up on a national register of vehicles involved in uh, serious crime. And I went, okay. And I, I didn't know what to say, really. I said, well, I'm just having some driving lessons with my boy. And he said, um, well, uh, well, it is. It's a bit of a problem, actually. And uh, I went, okay. I said, and he, he, I said, I hate saying this, but do you recognise me? He said, I do. And, and, and he said, I'm aware of the fact you've had a bit of time on your hands as well. So I thought, <laughs> Well, here we go. He's, he's a bit cheap. No, he was lovely. He was lovely. Um, anyhow, he then said, there's another problem. Um, it's not insured. I went, okay. So my <laughs> son is now thinking, this is the worst driving lesson I've ever had. I don't, <laughs> well, I don't, know, I don't know anything for the worst driving lesson. And, but I'm the passenger, but I'm, sp but I'm supposed to be in control. But I, my, <laughs> my poor son has all his records read through. <laughs> Luckily, his license is okay. The insurance thing is a clerical error. My insurer had written the number plate down wrong on the insurance document. I had the insurance document, but it had the wrong number plate on it by one letter, you could tell. Oh, that. wow. And so, and he very kindly let us go. But this is the worst bit. How about this? Imagine being that age. And because it was a, it was flagged on the computer system as a, uh, as a serious crime, a vehicle potentially involved in serious crime. The number plate's being cloned, obviously. Every police car in the area 
was flagged to join them. So by the time wow. by the time this had stopped, there were several police cars behind. That's fantastic. Oh. And we were part, but we were parked on a hill. We oh. had a hill start away with all these police cars behind him. And I just sat there and I looked at him and I said, I said, I don't know what to say, but you really don't want to fight this up. <laughs> and him. He let go and the car started rolling back. He panic and oh, it was all, we'll laugh about it forever. But as a, but as a, that's, I'll do that as a passenger. But the rest of it, I, I think Neil Clifford is absolutely right. I think if you love cars, and there's only one species that outside of this, and David Richard is one of them. A co-drivers, I can't. There's another episode in co-drivers. I don't. Yeah, think there care. is. Yeah, they are wonderful, yeah. but they're mad. But unless you're one of them, you want to operate the machinery because you're in love with the machinery and operating. Yeah. And and what you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Neil Clifford who says tires make no difference and steering feels made up, or you're like me who's into all that stuff. Fundamentally, you like operating machinery, yeah. and that, that's what that's what binds us all. I think. Yeah, I'm I'm jealous. If I'm a passenger, I'm basically just pissed off and jealous. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> and, I, right. and I manifest that by taking over. Yeah, yeah. but I, 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 think I, I think I'm the same. I think I'm the same. Yeah. Okay. Very good. This one, this one's we're getting on a bit here, so we're going to go. This next subject is uh, is very interesting. Um, Gunter Seiner uh, has has left his role at um, Haas F1. Uh, he left last week, didn't he? And the press release used the phrase "with immediate effect." Which is never a nice thing to read. Um, what do we make of Gunther? What do we make of his impact on the sport uh, and the role he played in the post uh, Drive to Survive era? Manish, what would you say? I think this is a very tricky one, actually, as a subject, because um, Gunther actually has been around quite a long time. It was Nicky Lauda who brought him into Formula One, and that was sort of 20 years ago at Jaguar. Yeah. Jaguar. And then, yeah, and then he off he goes to NASCAR, and he's done. You know, he had a carbon composite company with part of USF One, except he wasn't. But um, I, I, the whole preamble really gets you to how he ends up, and what a strange team in a way passes because um, it, it it's just not a normal Formula One constructor. Uh, you know, my understanding is that very very early on. It was his business concept, which was, let's basically, the rules say we can have as much of Ferrari as we want. So I'm going to go and see Stefano and have a chat with him because he was running Ferrari and say, look, does this work for you as a business model? And Stefano's like, it does, go and get the money and we've got no problem. So you've got this very strange team that, you know, originally, I mean, it's got three bases. So they kind of run the team out of England, but then it's got the design and the aero actually at Maranello. In theory, there are Chinese walls between it and Ferrari, but you know, who knows whether you go for a pizza with a good mate around the corner? I mean, I don't know. And then you've got this sort of base in North Carolina. And I think in some ways that is the impossible job. And I think if you look, their best season's their first season because it's got yeah. the most Ferrari in it. And after that, the FIA is squeezing every, you know, the rules are getting tighter and tighter. And of course, if you don't make a car, you don't have that level of expertise. I think it can only go in one direction. But <clears throat> I suppose the, the question is, how do we feel about why Gene Haas pressed the button? And there are a couple of things which seem quite, quite tough, actually. First of all, this man has been around and he's, you know, he's achieved, he's achieved what he's achieved. But um, I think he says that he was fired in a way over the phone that meant he couldn't say goodbye to the team, which I think is very harsh when you've really been a founder of the team. Yes, you're an employee, but you are a founder. And I think that's very tough. And, you know, to, to refer to Haas's results as embarrassing, I get it, but they have a peculiar business model. And I suppose my question would be, what next? And this guy, Ayo Komatsu, has taken over. And he used to be Roman Grosjean's race engineer back in the day. So you're kind of wondering now, they've got a technical director, or they've got a, a team boss who's effectively a race engineer. And We've been down that route before, but not so, haven't we? It doesn't work. Well, yeah. and so you, 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 you do wonder. And I think... Um, all I would say is that if this is all puckering the team up for a sale, 
you know, and that behind the scenes, maybe there was a kind of big disagreement about should we sell or not, then fair enough. And, you know, and the converse line is what Bernie said about him in June 2023. You know, he's a very famous guy, famous for losing. You know, which he didn't like at all. So it, it I, I just, you know, how to, it's you, a bit. You said about Gene House or Gunter. Oh, sorry, I thought he said it about Gunter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he said it about Gunter. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't have thought he'd say that about House. But I, I've always wondered, kind of what, what is it the House were doing in Formula One? I mean, it's great being lucky in your first year with this model, and reasonably lucky a couple of years later. But you know, you, 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 tooling around in ninth or tenth. When that's not your necessarily your core business, you've got a NASCAR team, you've got a machine tool business. I don't know why you do it. Yeah, Neil Clifford, do you care? I just like the fact he swears a lot. <laughs> you know, he, he probably was the star of the of the Netflix thing, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, in a way, because I don't know that much about the whole thing. I, I'm, a, I'm a normal spectator of F1, trying to know a bit more because I have to sort of talk about it a little bit. I think he was the star of that show to many respects because you're like, what a character. And we all like characters, don't we? Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, clearly I have no idea why he was fired. I was, I've seen the rumours about it being sold and, and all of that. Yeah, Gene Haas says no. To, I mean, maybe you would yeah, do. Yeah, but... Yeah. You can imagine, you know, as a, as an owner or a leader with with Gunter working for you, can imagine, even if you love him, I can imagine you being also very pissed off with him because he he's a he's probably quite unmanageable as a character. If you've got to manage, you know, have the responsibility of managing people and all of that, he might drive you a little bit mad. I could quite easily see you having a bit of a sort of ding dong on a few issues. Um, and it's a shame because he he seems to be an immensely likable chap. On the, you don't think you'll find another yeah. spot in F one? I th I suspect he will. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you'd, you'd give him a job as a commentator immediately, wouldn't you? But I'm I'm sure you don't earn two or three or five million quid doing that. Well, you yeah. Know, I, I suspect if, if, if Liberty have their way, they'll make sure he's in there just so he's a part of the next series of yeah. Drive to Survive. Chris yeah. Cooper, what do you think? Uh, it, it's not a huge surprise, is it? Um... We met him very briefly because he was at the Nürburgring 24... I think he was at Nürburgring 24-hour race in 2002 because... How do you remember this stuff? I don't even know what my name is. How do you remember that? <laughs> um, well, because if, if you're a bit weird and dyspraxic like me, you can associate stuff with you. So I know that it was 2002 uh, because that was the year that I made you wear that ridiculous coloured polo shirt that you yes. once did one of your whiskey diaries with. Yes. And actually, one of my sons said to me, because he saw it recently, that whiskey diary thing you did in that car in the COVID with that with the challenge consulting and the catering 24-hour polo shirt. And even one of my boys said to me, Dad, what were you thinking of when you made Monkey wear that? Well, it, just, it was the colour of diarrhoea. Anyhow, carry on. It was a, it was a bit pooey. <laughs> um, because Martin Leach, who was in the other auto car car, that S Ah, the yes, focus. The, the Focus, yeah. Um, a mate of mine who used to help run Martin Leach's go kart a million years ago was had left Raynard because he'd gone pop. And I went to see Martin because I sat next to him in Park Fermo right at the end of that race. And the focus happened to be next to us that your mate Steve Sutcliffe was also in. And uh, I said, so, uh, Hello, Martin, I'm in the other car that's just beaten you. Um, while we're here. Uh, my mate John from Raynard needs a job, and you've got Jaguar. And he said, yeah, actually, Gunter's here. And Gunter was just become technical director. But before that, he was in the Ford Rally team. So he's well, yeah. done, done a lot. He was a technical director for the Focus, Colin McRae time. He's got so, a bit of a Jos Capito career move thing. A bit going of that, on. isn't there? Yeah. There's a bit of that. But I just, you know, it's a results-orientated business. And I suspect Gene probably got... A bit fed up thinking, does he really care? Has he really? He's a funny character. He's from that part of Italy that, um, because he sounds Austrian, you think Gunter Steiner, that's an Aust a German or Austrian name, but he's Italian. Hmm. He comes from that bit of the Italian Dolomites that Austria and Italy have traded over. That's probably a polite way of putting it. Tyrol, the South Tyrol. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So no, no uh, I think it's there. probably it's a results orientated business. 
Um, they've seen how James Valls has started to revitalise Williams. Who Williams might be pants this year. Who knows? And I'm probably just thought, do you know what? We're going nowhere. We're going backwards. They had a great car on Saturday. They had made no. They just went backwards on Sundays. So very sadly, I suspect they always last. Um, they weren't in quality. In quality, they were very. They quite often they're in Q3. Yeah. Uh, Nico Hulkenberg, um, who was. Was he yeah, the most Barry. overtake? Wasn't he the most overtaken driver this year? They exactly, just... because it was qualifying versus yeah. his race. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the most overtakingest driver was Sergio Perez. Yeah. Because he was always starting near the back because he yeah. popped up Saturdays, had the fastest <laughs> car. Yeah. So get the other way. So Nico Hulkenberg was the most overtaken driver. So yeah, it's it's. Um, I, I suspect you're right. I mean, he. You know, he made he made famous a new way of saying the F word. Fucking. Yeah, he's great. Fucking. Going to a fucking Steiner. Uh, Edward, lo Edward Lovett, what do you feel? Uh, I don't feel much. If they could just fire a few more people <laughs> during the off season uh, so we can mix it up a bit for this uh, season to come, that would be nice. Yeah. I We won't get that, unfortunately. I think I, <laughs> part, part of the interesting thing for me is, is the sort of cult of personality and celebrity because... It's it's the only time in my life where I've been very connected to a sport, thought I knew about a bit about a sport, but because I wasn't watching Drive to Survive and I haven't really watched much of it at all, the emergence of Gunter Steiner, the celeb, was totally bizarre to me. So you'd watch him sort of... It was amazing watching commentators and people's reaction to him change over the last three years, but, of course, I wasn't aware why it was changing. Yeah, There was a bit of reverence towards him and a bit, a bit of sort of how cool he was, but I'm just thinking, he just runs a team that's getting nowhere. And I couldn't really understand why he was, you know, ever wanted to talk to him. But now I do, I'm trying to watch a couple of episodes and I can see, I totally agree with Neil, he's hilarious. Yeah. yeah he's hilarious, funny. But it's, it's a, I think, and the reason why I asked, I think I wanted to talk about this is, it's a, it exposes the paradox of, of Formula One and of motorsport in as much as, if there's any sport that's never really wanted to celebrate failure or people that are part of failure, it's Formula One. And and Gunter might be the first example of someone who became a celeb. I think that's right. For, for being yeah. a part of the slow end. Uh, you, you're, yeah. you're never you're never fetid. Every other sport has its Eddie the Eagle or Eric the Eel that breaks the mould. <laughs> Formula One has never celebrated slowness. It, it's, always, it's always found it offensive and... Unprofessional, loserish. There's, yeah, there's no, there's no way around it. And Gunter was the first person I think to embody celebrating being at the at the non pointy end. And I yeah. wonder whether that I wonder whether that sat well with the sport or not. And well, I, wonder... I suspect it probably did, but didn't sit at all well with the bloke who was employing him. Yes, yeah, and I, I think, think I can I can imagine that you'd wake up one day and well, think, "What am I getting out of this?" Yeah. If if I, if I got my tech people to do a simple word association Google search now with if you type in Haas F1, what's the first word you say? It would be Gunther. Yeah, and I think he'd be a bit pissed off with that after a time, and maybe yeah. there, there, there's just one teeny tiny counter argument. Something he said yesterday, I read a transcript um, of an interview he gave, and he said, no matter what you say, think of Drive Survive, he was instrumental in keeping the team alive after COVID because of the sponsorship they got. He did do that. on yeah. his fame. So his exposure, if it's not going to be on track, it's going to be at the end of the year on 10 hours of television. Yeah. And I think you've hit the paradox right on the head. Is this sport or is this the show business? And um, you got it. If you can't win, the best way to do it is deflect with a bit of sweary humour. And you got the sponsors, you got the airtime, yeah. you're there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm going to move on to two car garage. I've got. Um, I'm going to miss out a couple of words. Now, is this? It, it begins under the radar cars. Is that the one? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can't. I, I've got it wrong. Can someone read it out to me because I've screen grabbed it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Thank this you, from Andrew Hurst. Cars. Um. It's a recession year. Yeah. You're looking for two under the radar cars, which won't attract too much attention on the road. One must be a coupe slash two doors, brackets, no convertibles. What? No convertibles. 
two door coupe, mm. and the other a four door saloon sedan for our American cousins or an SUV. Uh, as you are a very successful entrepreneur, the budget is unlimited. Both cars must be on sale today slash new as safety, boys and girls, is a concern. Most importantly, Andrew tells us, choose the paint colours wisely. I like that. Oh, I forgot the paint colours bit. Andrew will be so upset. Uh, no, I, actually, I know my paint. <laughs> Go on, say metallizato with that little nasal thing you do. Go on. Metallizato. Baby. <laughs> that's not the way I thought you were going to say it. No, that's not the way. I I can't remember the nasally way I said it. Metallizato. Okay, I'm go I'm going first now. Um, this is so unimaginative, and I look I look and sound like part of their press department, but I'm going straight to crew because I'm getting in there quickly because I reckon Clifford might be following me up the M5 and the M6 quickly, and I want to get there before he does. Uh, and I'm I'm going to double dip. I'm going to buy a Conti GT as the two-door, and I'm going to have myself a Spur as the four-door. I don't want the SUV. They're both going to be in, in Brewster, and they're both going to have Cohiba Hyde. Uh, they're going to be fully optioned. They will not have any kind of personalised number plate, so they won't look like they're his and hers cars, or hers and hers, or his and his. But I, but I just, for me, right now, Bentley answers every single question I ask about my everyday motoring. Which I'm bit of under the radar does that? I was going to ask that. I mean, how they're under the radar? They're, they're under the radar, aren't they? He they might be in like cars. Dubai or something like that. He'd be under the radar in Dubai. Dark green, no one's going to spot it. It's a recession year. You're looking for two under the radar cars. What? Read the bit about the budget. Budget Unli is unlimited. He's there gonna we go! Be, it's so going to be if you're, into, if, you're into, if you're into cars, which bit's more important? Under the radar or no budget? <laughs> No Andrew, I'm really sorry. No That's budget true. always wins. Yeah, it does, yeah. No budget. I was going to answer this with... You've, uh, mi you've missed a massive opportunity if you've gone budget because there was no budget. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Mr Cooper, so we can hear you drip on about some shit Toyota you're going to buy so that you're <laughs> your kind. You can fuck myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, Andrew. I've chosen... Oh. I've chosen the under-the-radar M2 comp hmm. that I'd send to Licho and get Licho to spend all the money in the world on, including painting it or doing that lovely wrap he does in BMW 287 code Mauritius Blue. Oh. Is, that quite, is that dark? Is it Mauritius Blue? These, 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 uh, these are supposed to be new cars, aren't they? Yeah. It's a new car. Yeah. Well, the, the they don't M2 do a competition M2, M2 yeah. So what's the current M2 then? Sorry. The current well, not M2. a competition. You've lost. You lost. Oh, dear. <laughs> so oh. picky. Oh, dear, um, Chris. Another one. That, and the other one is not gone well. And the other one, <laughs> all I can hear is a bloody droning noise. <laughs> reminds me of too many times I've been a passenger. Um, the other one would be a B3, Alpina B3 wagon. Clear glass. D decaled. Under the radar. Alpina green, to that tobacco -y interior colour, M2 comp, comp M2 non-comp, new one, Mauritius blue, B3 wagon. So, the, so just to be clear, the second one said it was a four-door or an SUV, nothing about being allowed in a state car. Carry on. I just, didn't just read that bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have so, put that up. All, all, in, all that. in all, all in right. all, a two minutes to forget for Chris Cooper. I let's have, move, I have just done on. that. Let's move on to Neil Clifford and we'll leave Chris. And then I'm not a successful entrepreneur, so I'm Chris, allowed to copy Chris up. RTQ Cooper can stay there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Neil Clifford, Neil Clifford, are you, are you going to stay within the rules or not? Yes, yes. In fact, I'm I'm talking about real life. I've just recently done this. Not to say I'm a successful entrepreneur, but I've certainly bought the two cars that I'm now going to talk about. Oh, I like I, it. Carry on. Yes. I'm buying an Alpina. Yes. Um, and I did note just at the end in time, as you read it out, that it wasn't about a touring. So yeah, I didn't read that bit, even though I read it out. In real life, obviously, I've got a touring. In 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 fantasy world, I two car garage. I'm having a saloon. Yeah. But I'm having a B5 because I, I just they're not big enough those threes for me. I like. I, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah. yeah I I think, I'm, with, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's B5 saloon. 
Um, and no stickers, probably <laughs> anthracite, chocolate leather, clear glass, obviously, no badges, um, lovely. And then I'm going to, and then these almost match these cars, don't they, in terms of words, an Alpine. Yeah. I'm going to buy a little Alpine because I think that is the most under the radar sports car. Yeah. Um, I have bought one. I don't have it yet. I'm looking forward to get it. It's with Ian Litchfield. It's coming on Monday. I'm very excited. I've lowered the seats. I've put the spaces on. I've got those little thingies, the life, 110 life things. I'm about, four, boy. I'm about four years behind on this car. And um, I'm really looking forward to it, actually. So that, and I think they are very under the radar, low key machines of pleasure. They are. They are yeah. all of that. Good choice. Uh, Manish. I'm afraid I fucked this up completely. <laughs> oh. you, you can't. You, you can't, can't really have made more up. of a mess of it than RTQ up there. Oh, I don't know. I did the bit that I missed out. It, I just saw the words because I saw the logo in both cars must be on sale today. I yeah. assume somewhere. I didn't see that stroke new uh, as safety is a concern. So uh, you've bought a Lamborghini Countach as always. <laughs> <laughs> safety, <laughs> safety is a concern. Safety. I did buy a car with an airbag. So my first one would always have to be a 456 MGT in Tour de France blue yeah. with Quillo Naturale leather. And it does have, it does have an airbag. I'm going to get the one with a big steering wheel. Now, my second one, I was thinking boxy cars are always under the uh, under the radar. If a car looks like a box, it's, it's under the radar. And if a car is boxy and looks a bit old and 70s, it's very under the radar. So I picked, I found this on Kidston's website. He sold this a few years ago. And it is a 77 Monteverdi 375 stroke. Yeah, four. that's a great car. In that metallic is. blue with red seat. I think people would walk yeah. past that and go, bah. That, well, that, was, si that was Simon's own car, that one. Was yeah. it? I think I'm not dad's... sure that's under the radar. <laughs> you a bit, bit of dog dick leather inside there. <laughs> Manish, Manish, remember, remember, the most important part of this was the most important part was the limitless budget. Forget the under the radar thing. Yeah. Don't forget about that. Chris yeah. Cooper really missed a chance here. He yeah. really missed a chance. Okay. Do I look like I'm bothered? Actually, <laughs> I'm quite, I actually Edward, am quite bothered. Edward, what are you going to do? So I, I've taken this quite seriously. Um, Save us. Well, fine. I, so my, my two-door coupe is going to be the brand new... I'm sure soon to be delivered, you might be able to get one in Germany, Mercedes AMG GT. Because yeah. they they they've they sort of pulled back on the aggressive design of that car, haven't they? They've tried to make it more sort of Carrera 2, standard Carrera 2 911. So that would be my yeah. sort of understated sports car coupe. And then my new car is going to be one of these Toyota Century SUVs. Oh, um, I, yeah. I, I've got a hankering for one of those. That's good. Yeah, You've I got like that. The real thing about these buses now, haven't you? Well, no, this is that's not really a bus. I just I, I watched a video. It's, it's just I just like the story of the original Century. And if they do, they we'll get, get one any... of those. Then, well, just you just you wait till this jumper changes in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, that's all of us done, isn't it? Okay, let's it go. Is. Let's go for some quick music. Uh, Edward Lovett. Uh, I am. I don't know the artist, but I'm going to tell you in two seconds. Hold on, caller. It's the song is called Ferrari. It's out at the moment. I thought it seemed like a appropriate uh, song to uh, accompany the movie. Uh, and I think by here it's by James Hype and Miggy Della Rossa. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I Ferrari. like it. Whenever he says the names, Manish just looks round as if someone's farted in the room. Right, <laughs> uh, Manish, uh, who, who are you going to go for? Um, I'm. I don't know if someone's picked this before, but I heard this yesterday, and I just remembered how grand it was. And in a car, I have heard it, it is all along the Watchtower. Jimi Hendrix. You know, 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 that. That. Nice. You become with Nail, and that's who you are. It's good. Uh, Chris Cooper. Uh, again, I'm not sure whether we've had this, but 
and I can't quite believe this is true, this year marks 40 years since Van Halen released the album Jump. 40 years, and the eponymous well, title track, Jump. Is, we have is, both chosen that twice already, I think. Who cares? It's 40th anniversary. We're bloody having it again. Van Halen, <laughs> Jump. <laughs> it's one of the greatest songs. OK, uh, Neil Clifford. If you've got three older brothers, you're, like I have, I was the last attempt of a girl, you're bound to have three older brothers that are all into the Who. Yeah. Therefore, I am a Who fan. And uh, Who's Next is the best album. And Behind Blue Eyes is just a great, great like, song. Man. Yeah. So I was having a think in the car the other day. Who are my favourite female singers? The ones, proper warblers, not, not pop singers. Um, but they, some of them obviously sang pop songs. And I reckon in my, this, this woman is in my top five. Uh, Annie Lennox, I think, has just oh. gone. When, she's, when, when she was on proper super unleaded, late 80s, early 90s, and she was, yep. she'd been to Litfield and she was like, map, stage 3.54, she was on it. Yep. And I reckon on one of her solo albums, a song called Little Bird, when she really gets going. Nice. It's a cracking that. tune. Get, get it on, the, get it on. It's, it's fantastic. Really, really great tune. Uh, so that was episode 49 of the Collecting Annex podcast. And we're not about to record the next episode 50 immediately after this. Not in any way. Having a simple change of clothes. So I'm now going to make my change of clothes to do the record because everyone wants it to be so that no one spots the fact that we've done it. So if I no, look, hang on a minute, we, we've, we've got I'm to wearing this in the next episode. You know, we just stop this when I start in the next one, okay? We're but we've got, to, we, we've no. got to have to do a very quick pause so we can do an edit. Okay. And, and then Johnny, we're stopping now. <laughs>